Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Baptist Church. I'm so glad you could be with us this morning and uh, getting into our study here in a new series that we're going to introduce today. But before we get into that, uh, let's have a few announcements to get started. And uh, again, thank you for your faithfulness in our missions project and your tithes and offerings. And uh, if this lockdown continues a whole lot longer, we might transition to a new missions project. But for right now, we're continuing in this same project, uh, setting aside money for printing tracks, which will really help us in ministering here in our community. Don't forget on Tuesday, Pastor Tony is going to begin a new Bible study series Tuesday night. So I hope you'll make sure that you uh, access the video or the audio uh, for that Tuesday Bible study, and be sure to pray for one another. It's a great privilege that we have to be able to pray for each other. And if you have prayer requests, please be sure to share that with us. We love to pray for one another, and we love to praise God for what he's doing in each other's lives. And so I want to encourage you to share those and to welcome when other people share with us so that you can thank God and, and pray for one another as well. Then also you notice number four in our announcements that we have a new Sunday morning Bible study starting next week. That's the continuation of our series on Strengthen Thy Brethren. And so if you were with us before for the first half, uh, the, the, the brown book that we had uh, covered the first part of 1 Peter. And now this is the second part of 1 Peter. We'll, we will be beginning this next week. So we finally have the books. If you would like to get one, you can get one for 3,000 shillings. Or for families, you can get two for 5,000 shillings or multiples of two for 5,000 shillings each group of two. So if you need those, please contact me. I'll try to bring them to where you are, as long as you're not so far from here. If you're in uh, Kampala, Wakiso, uh, maybe in Seta, uh, those ends, I I'd love to come by and have an excuse to see you and bring you the books that you need so you can follow along starting next Sunday morning uh, on our Sunday morning Bible study. That's next week starting the 28th of June. Now today we also start a new series here in our main service and we're going to be going through the book of John and looking at different people uh, that met with the Messiah who had that face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ and I'm calling the series Divine Encounters. But we're going through and looking, I'm sorry, divine appointments. And we're going through and looking at those times that people saw Jesus for who he really was. And we're going to use the book of John as our guide. We'll look at other passages as well, but our series is going to follow through the book of John. So if you don't have a Bible, at least a New Testament, or if you don't have that app on the phone and you need one, please contact me. Contact us here at the church. We have uh, the Gospel of John. Some of them are John and Romans in multiple languages. We have English, Runyon Kore, Luganda, Ateso. We even have in Arabic. So if you need that, please let me know. And uh, I'd love to schedule a time that we can meet here at the church or I come to you and give you that Gospel of John free of charge so that you can follow along in the scriptures of what we're studying in this new series. Well, to begin this morning, I hope you figured out we're going to start in the Gospel of John. And we're in John chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 29 up to verse 23. John chapter 1, verse 29 to 23, that's where we'll start this morning. So let's go ahead and open your Bible there and follow along as I read John 1, starting in verse 29. The next day, John, this is John the Baptist... John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water." As I mentioned, our new series is entitled Divine Appointment. Probably we each have appointments in our life. Some have a, a very strict schedule that they follow. Some of us uh, might have a less strict schedule, but we all have appointments. We all have meetings or events which are scheduled in our life. 
But sometimes there are things which come by surprise into our life. But those things are not a surprise to God. I call them a divine appointment where God put something on my schedule that I didn't know was there, but he has a purpose for it. And so today we're going to look at John the Baptist's divine appointment, and I hope you'll be encouraged by this series and even today in this study. But let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God who is sovereign. You are in control of everything. You have a plan and a purpose, and not just a plan or a purpose, but it's your plan and purpose. And yours are always good. And your plan and purpose for me is special. It is specifically for my life. And for each one watching and listening this morning, your plan for him or for her is special. It's unique. It is custom made. You designed it just for that individual. You have given us a purpose. What a privilege that is that we not only have a purpose, but it's your purpose for our lives. And so we thank you. Thank you for being our God our purposeful God and the God who empowers us. You give us strength. You give us the power to fulfill your purpose in our lives. And I pray that we would have more understanding of that as we study the scriptures today. May your Holy Spirit work in our lives and teach us so that we would see Christ better in this, our divine appointment this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we think about John the Baptist, if you recall his relationship to Jesus Christ, we're going to go back and look at their boyhood, the young life of John the Baptist and of Jesus. So let's start with John in Luke chapter 1, verse 13 to 17. Again, our study series is going to be going through the book of John, but we're going to look at the other passages in order to learn more about these people that John mentions. So in Luke chapter 1, we see the promise of John the Baptist's birth. This is part of the Christmas story many times. And we go back and before the angel appeared to Mary and to Joseph, the angel appeared to a man named Zacharias. Zacharias was married to a woman named Elizabeth. They were very old. But Zacharias was serving in the temple and the angel appeared to him. And we see in verse 13, the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the power, in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This was John the Baptist's purpose before he was ever born, before he was even conceived. God knew the purpose and the plan that he had for John the Baptist. And he's revealing that to his father, Zacharias. And ordinarily, they would have named the son after his father. But Zacharias said, no, his name is John. Zacharias and his wife, Elizabeth. Now, we're going to see that name come up again as we look at the boyhood of Jesus. Still in Luke chapter 1, jump over to verse 34. The angel now is appearing to Mary, and she's wondering, I'm going to have a child? See, there were two miraculous births taking place. For for Elizabeth, she was old. She was past the age of being able to give birth. And yet, God was using her to bring forth this son named John. And now we're going to see a miraculous birth in the life of Mary. On the opposite end of the age scale, she was a teenager. And God is going to use her to bring forth the Messiah. And we see that here in verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel... How shall these things be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, 
she have also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Two miracles. One at the old end of the spectrum of the age uh, lifespan, where Elizabeth was too old, but God was going to give her a son. The other, Mary, who was too young. In fact, she had not yet been fully wed to her husband, Joseph. She says, I've never been with a man. Both of those miraculous births. How could those things be, Mary asked. And the angel answered in verse 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Hey, when God has a plan for your life or my life, it may seem impossible to us, but with God, nothing is impossible. I have to tell you, when I realized that God wanted me to come to Namagongo, to Charlie Wajala, and begin a church, I said, God, I don't know what to do. And he said, that's good, because he wanted me to follow his directions. He wanted to tell me what to do step by step, not for me to lean on my own understanding. And God can do the impossible. And when you look at our church, truly, this is a testament of God's power. It's an, it's a, an example. It's evidence that God's purpose, nothing is impossible. Because you are not here because of me. You are here and part of this church because God is building his church. Nothing is impossible with God. And I'm so thankful for that. We've seen the boyhood of John and Jesus, but John was called John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Sometimes people would call that. So let's look at that baptism, the baptism. And we see in Matthew chapter three, I'm calling it the event, the event in Matthew chapter three, where Jesus comes to John and says, I need to be baptized. John, uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, John refused him, saying, I, need, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto them, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, or landing upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now before we look at John's participation in this event, I want you to notice something in these last two verses. Jesus when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. This means Jesus had to be in the water. That's why baptism, biblical baptism, is something which must be done by going into the water and coming up out of the water. We see it in Jesus. We see it in the Ethiopian. Every time baptism is identified, water baptism is shown in the Bible, it is somebody going into the water and coming up out of the water. In fact, that word baptize means to place into. We can change and try to use that word for something else, but it doesn't change the true meaning. Even if somebody uses it in a wrong way, the truth of its meaning is to place into. And that's why we baptize by placing into the water. Now, why was Jesus baptized? See, we looked at John, John's boyhood and Jesus' boyhood. They grew up as cousins. If we were to read through that whole passage in Luke chapter 1, we'd see that Mary, when she was told of the child uh, that she would have, the Messiah, which would be born, she was told, and your cousin Elizabeth is also with child of six months. Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, so Jesus and John the Baptist were also related. They grew up as related people, and Mary had spent time with Elizabeth and probably continued that even as their children grew. John the Baptist would have known Jesus as a child, but he didn't yet know him as the Messiah. And there are things that John would have learned as a childhood, and perhaps he was told that Jesus is the Messiah, but we don't know whether he truly believed that. I'm sure that in the home, Mary told her children, Jesus is the promised Messiah. But we know that Jesus' own half-brothers, who grew in the same home as he did, 
they did not accept Jesus as their Messiah until after Jesus had resurrected from the dead. So there were those who heard things as a childhood but didn't believe it. And there were people who believed things as a child which were not necessarily true. Perhaps that's where you find yourself. Maybe you've heard things from your childhood about baptism. That baptism washes away sins. That baptism is a sprinkling or something like that. But the Bible gives us the meaning and the explanation for it. What did Jesus say about baptism? He said, Suffer it now to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was not needing his sins washed away. Jesus had no sin, and he knew that baptism could not pay for sin. If baptism could have washed away our sins, Jesus didn't need to die. His baptism would have been enough for our salvation. But Jesus knew that in order to pay for our sin, it must require death. And that's why he died on the cross. Here, he's telling us baptism is to fulfill all righteousness. See, in Romans 3, and even back in the Psalms, we are told that there is none righteous. No, not one. No one is righteous. No human being is righteous. No descendant of Adam is righteous. Because in Adam, sin, sin passed upon all men. The only exception to that is Jesus Christ, which we saw in the account that we read in Luke 1 about Mary, that the Holy Ghost put Jesus into Mary's womb. Miraculous. And she produced that child not of Adam's sinful flesh, but a special creation of God put into her womb. And so Jesus was the only righteous man to ever live on this earth. And when we accept his payment for our sins and we receive his gift of eternal life, he gives to us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that we are made the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus Christ. So that righteousness we receive. And now Jesus is telling us baptism is necessary to fulfill, to live out. We have it and now we're going to live it to the full. We're going to live it completely requires baptism. Baptism is the first step of obedience. Before we can really be serving God in ministry, baptism shows our obedience to God. And Jesus has not yet begun his ministry, and he's coming to be baptized of John and then formally begin his ministry. And we see it actually happen the very next day, and I'll show you that in a moment. But the event, we've seen it here that Jesus came and said, John, I need to be baptized. And John said, no, I need to be baptized of you. And we'll see why he had that understanding. He knew what the Messiah would give. And John wanted that. But Jesus said, no, I need to be water baptized because this is part of obedience. And I'm going to set the example. I'm totally obedient to the Father. And I'm going to show you the example that you also need to be obedient to. To God and obedience begins with baptism. Well, when Jesus was baptized, what was the response that came? Jesus came up out of the water, and there was, uh, we see that heaven was opened, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and landed on him. And there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, who would call him the Son? Of course, that's the Father. So in this event, we see Jesus the Son the Holy Spirit, and the Father all active at the same time in this one event. Now, there's one God, but he exists in three persons. The Father, this is my beloved Son, I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit coming and and showing the power that he has, and Jesus being the obedient Son there, and the man who connects man to God. All of this being shown in this event. There's one God, but he exists in three persons. He is too wonderful to be contained in one personality. So our one God exists at the same time as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Our God is eternal. He has no limit. So it is not difficult for him to simultaneous, at the same time, be the Father. He is eternally the Father. He is eternally the Son and eternally the Holy Spirit. We don't always necessarily see him as the Father, the Son, because we are limited. 
but he is not limited in his expression of himself in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we see Jesus Christ in his obedience and that voice from heaven saying, I'm pleased by your obedience. And you know what? When you and I obey God, he also says, I'm well pleased. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, we see the event here in Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17. But what did that mean to John? Why was this important to him? Well, let's go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, where we began, and we'll see that evidence. What did this event prove to John? John 1, and we'll look in verses 29 to 34. We already read 29 to 31 earlier, and so let me continue on in verse 31. John says, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Why did John say, I need to be baptized of you? Because John had been told, whoever you see the Spirit descending and landing on him, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. The believers are baptized. They receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But remember, what is the meaning of baptism? To place into. The Holy Ghost is placed into the believer. Jesus said, I'm going to go, but when I go, I will send to you the comforter and he will be in you. And we see that in the book of Acts. We won't take time, but at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came into the apostles. A few chapters later, he came into the Jewish believers. And a few chapters later, he came into the Gentile believers. And so after, by the time we finish the book of Acts, every believer, the moment they are saved, they receive the Holy Ghost. The book of Acts is that transition from Jesus' ministry to the ministry of the church. And so some things had their beginning so the Holy Ghost came into the apostles, then the Jewish believers, then the Gentile believers. And now we, just as Jesus promised, we have the baptism, the placing into of the Holy Ghost. That's what John wanted. And he is testifying, I saw the Holy Spirit come on this man. I heard that voice from heaven, and I know this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah that we have hoped for. The evidence convinced John, this is the one we've looked for. Now, John probably had heard Jesus was the one because when Jesus came, he knew who he was. But when Jesus came for baptism, that's when he knew this is the one that was promised. He knew him as his cousin. Now he knew him as his Christ. And that was the divine appointment. John didn't know it was going to happen that day. John was already there baptizing. He was already doing what God had purposed for him to do. And in the place of obedience, he had that meeting with the Messiah when he knew this is the Son of God. And it shows us the importance of being faithful in what God has given us to do. God has divine appointments for my life and your life. And when we are faithful, obedient to what God has for us day by day by day, will be ready for those divine appointments. Well, what did this event and this evidence do for John? Well, we're going to see the boldness that he had. The boldness, and we see this in John chapter 1. We can look in verse 35 to 37. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. John was bold to tell people, who Jesus was. But in his preaching, we see a boldness to expose sin. Go with me back to Luke. Luke chapter 3 this time. Luke chapter 3. And we'll look in verses 3 to 6 to begin. Luke chapter 3. Starting in verse 3, this is talking about John the Baptist. And he came into all the country about or around Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of of sins. Now notice here the repentance, baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It is not baptism which removes sins. It's the repentance which re brings us 
to what removes sins. Repentance, meaning a change of mind or a change of direction. People have been trying to come to God by their works. But there's only one way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Not by works, but by a person, Jesus Christ. And John is saying, if you've repented, if you've turned from trying to please God by your works and just received the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ, that is what removes sins. Remember, we saw baptism could not remove sins. It was the repentance. It was the faith, putting our faith in Jesus instead of faith in anything else because only Jesus can remove our sins. 1 John chapter 1 tells us, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins. And so John is preaching, believe in the Messiah. Turn from what you are trusting in and believe the Messiah who can save you and remove your sins. And if you've believed, I'm gonna, I can baptize you to show others that you have had that faith. He was preaching that baptism. That baptism is for those who have turned, repented, turned to Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He continues, verse 4, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John's preaching this message of saying, you're trusting in something other than Jesus. I'm going to expose. What's crooked, I'm going to make straight. Those that are lifted up are going to be brought down. Those that are hiding down will be raised up. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. John was bold in his preaching. We see an example of that in verses 19 and 20. But Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's his brother Philip's wife, and, un- and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Now this Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, was the son of Herod the Great, who was the Herod who killed the babies in, Jeru- in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. So Herod the Great, he had several sons, and he divided his territory up among those sons. So this Herod the Tetrarch had one region, He had another brother who was a Herod down in Jerusalem. He only served for about 10 years, and then he was put aside, and the Roman government put in somebody else, which was later Pontius Pilate, and we see that in Jesus' crucifixion. So the same role, like a governor over that region. But now up in Galilee, where John is, where Jesus grew up, uh, Herod the Tetrarch is there. And Herod the Tetrarch had taken the wife of Philip, his brother, had taken that to be his own. Now, I don't know if this Philip was the Herod that was removed from Jerusalem or a different one. I couldn't find that answer. But still, he had taken his brother's wife and John said, that's wrong, Herod. You shouldn't do that. Now, do politicians normally like people to tell them they did something wrong? (laughs) Not normally. And Herod was no different. And so when John told him that, he put John in prison. But John was not afraid to preach the truth to expose sin. But why did he expose sin? He exposed the sin to show their need of a Savior. And so along with that exposing of sin, he would exhort the sinner saying, please believe in Jesus. Go back and look in verse 16 here of Luke 3. John answered saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. So here John is preaching and he's saying, you've been going the wrong way, but turn to the one who is the right way, the only way, Jesus Christ. He was exhorting them. He said, there's one coming after me, much mightier than I. I'm baptizing with water. He will baptize with something else, the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, when we read earlier in Luke, we saw that John 
was looking, he was told that he would baptize John with the Holy Ghost. But now John is mentioning two things, the Holy Ghost and fire. And sometimes people think those are both positive things, but they've not understood the scripture correctly because in verse 17, we see what the fire is going to do. It is going to burn with fire unquenchable. And this is one group of people. John is saying he will baptize you, this group of people. Some of you will accept, some of you will not. So some of you will receive the Holy Ghost. Some of you will receive fire judgment. And that's what he talks about in verse 17. He talks about taking the wheat and dividing it from the chaff. And we don't have as much wheat here in Uganda, but we have rice or beans or peas. And you often see when rice or peas have been, have been shelled, then they take them and they toss them. They have a pan or a basket and they toss it so the wind can blow that lighter material, which is not edible, it blows it aside. They toss it up and they catch the beans or they catch the peas. And this is held for the goodness of the family or for eating. And with the other stuff, they sweep it up. It's gathered and it's burned. Some are acceptable. It's brought home. The rest is put into fire. It is not acceptable. It's not brought home. And that's what John is warning them. If you receive the gift of eternal life from the Messiah, Jesus Christ... <laughs> He brings you home. You are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and you are made his child. But if you don't receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, you're gathered up and burnt. And that is hellfire and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. John is warning them. He is exhorting sinners and he's telling them there is a judgment and it is a fiery judgment. Now, we wouldn't necessarily welcome that message if we were the ones headed for fire. But the word preached here, that the Bible uses in verse 18, his exhortation preached he unto the people. That word preached means to give good news. Why is it good news to tell people about hell? Because we can tell them there's a way of escape, which is Jesus Christ. John was exposing sin, so they realized they were sinners. He was exhorting them that they have a choice to believe or not to believe. And in all of this, he was exalting the Savior. In John chapter 3, we won't read all of this. In John 3, verses 30 to 36. But you can turn with me there. And we'll look at those two verses. Verse 30, John says, a very important verse for us to live by. He must increase, but I must decrease. John was saying, it's not about me. It's about him. You that have been following me, you need to look to Jesus. Don't look at me. I'm just something, I'm just an arrow pointing people to Jesus. He must increase and I must decrease. That was John's attitude. He was exalting the Savior. And in verse 36, he gives that hope. He says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This goes right with the message we saw in Luke 3. Those that believe, you have eternal life. You are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and you're brought home. You belong to Him. But those that do not believe, they are condemned already. They're already considered rubbish. It's just a matter of time before He sweeps them up and casts them into the fire. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, it's a matter of time. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Perhaps today is your divine appointment. Will you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone? Not what you've done, not who your family is, not what church you attend, but Jesus only is the way of salvation. John the Baptist, Jesus said there is none greater born of women than John the Baptist. No greater prophet. And yet John said, I'm nothing. He must increase. John could not bring salvation. The baptism of John the Baptist did not remove sins. Only Jesus could do that. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Would you put your faith in Christ? If you've never done that, please contact us. I'll give you the contact information at the end of this video. But if you want to know right now, that's the great thing of YouTube. Just jump to the end and you'll see our church phone number and website. Or you can see it in these video notes. But contact us. Let us show you from the Bible how you can have that divine appointment and meet with your Messiah, Jesus Christ. John was exalting the Savior. 
And it all goes back to what we saw at the beginning when he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The beholding, that was the moment that was John's divine appointment. And we saw his attitude back in chapter 1, in verses 6 to 8. We can see John's purpose. John 1, verses 6 to 8. First, we're looking at John's role, and we see his appointment. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might be saved, might be believed. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. John was not the, the answer. John was the one pointing people to the answer, Jesus Christ. That was his purpose. Before he was born, his father was told his purpose is to prepare the way of the Lord. John was appointed. He had that appointment letter, if we want to think of it that way. His appointment from God was to tell people this is the light, to be a witness, to bear witness of the light. That was John's appointment. Well, what was his attitude? Just a few verses later, we see in verse 35, we read this earlier, the next day, this is the next day after John baptized Jesus. He baptized him, then the next day, John stood and two of his disciples, two people that had been following John. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. Hey, guys, this is the one I've been telling you about. I saw him yesterday. He came and was baptized. This, you've been following me, but you've been following me so that you can see who the Messiah is. This is the Messiah. This is the Lamb of God. And notice what happened. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. They left John to follow Jesus. That's the goal. Not for people to follow me as a pastor. Not for people to follow you. Not even for our children to follow us as parents. But that we would point them to Jesus and say, Behold the Lamb of God. That was John's role. And he had the appointment. And he had the right attitude. But in order to do that, remember what he said. I was told that the one who comes... He will baptize with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost also has a role in this. And we see that in John 15, verses, verse 26. John 15, Jesus is speaking. And in verse 26, he says, But the Comforter, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, John was testifying of Jesus. The Holy Spirit does the same thing. And again, in this verse, we see Jesus speaking, saying the Father will send the Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Once again, you cannot deny the principle and the, the, the meaning of the Trinity of God being three persons in one God. And so the Comforter would come and testify of Jesus Christ. In 1 John 5, verses 6 through 10, again, we see, we won't turn there for time, but you can do that and see how the Holy Spirit is working to point people to Jesus Christ. John was baptized with the Holy Ghost, and that empowered him to fulfill his role of pointing people to Jesus. But did you know that's the role for you and me as well? Our job is to point people to Jesus Christ. And God gave us the Holy Spirit so that we have that power to do it. He must increase. I must decrease. In John chapter 20, it's getting towards the end of the gospel. Jesus has died. He's been buried. And he rose again the third day. And now he's speaking to his disciples in John 20, verse 21. And Jesus said to them, again, peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, so send I you. Jesus is sending them out as he sends us out, as the Father sent him, we have been sent in the power of the Holy Ghost, which we see in the very next verse, verse 22. They received the Holy Ghost to give them that power to go. We are ambassadors of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us we are his ambassadors. We have been appointed to go and say, behold the Lamb of God. Hey, who is it that God is giving you a divine appointment with this week? If you've never come to Jesus Christ, make today that appointment day. Put your faith in him alone for salvation.
If you are saved, God wants you to tell others. And he's bringing people into your life. He's putting people on your appointment calendar. You might not know about it. Let's be looking for opportunities. God, who did you bring to me today that I can point them to Jesus? What a privilege. What an opportunity for us as his children to glorify him, to praise him, to exalt our Savior. I hope you'll be faithful in doing that. Well, if you need to know more about Jesus Christ, if you need counseling, please contact us here at Faith Baptist Church. Our website is www.faith.ug, or you can reach us by phone at 776 14 We look forward to giving you hope and encouragement from the Word of God. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Look forward to next week's Divine Appointment.